thanks for staying with us. The Florida Department of Children and Families is a very important organization doing a lot of good in our community, so we thought we'd bring them in today to talk about what they do and find out more about the agency. Joining us today, we have uh, Bob McBartland and also Dennis Miles, uh, both with Florida Department of uh, Children and Families. And uh, you're doing a lot in our community, so thank you for being here. Appreciate you taking the time to come up to this part of, of the region and talk to us a little bit today. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for Great. having us, Ed. We'll start with uh, Dennis Miles. Uh, give us your title first. Uh, Ed, I'm the Regional Managing director, director for the Southeast Region of the Department of Children and Families. And the Southeast Region consists of Circuit 17, which is Broward County, Circuit 15, which is Palm Beach County, and Circuit 19, which is the Treasure Coast in Okeechobee County. Okay, very good. So let's start with the bigger picture. Most people may have heard of DCF, but they probably don't know a lot why you exist, what you do, and, and what you're all about. So let's look at the big picture. What exactly is DCF? Well, from the big picture, we run four, we're, we're involved in a, in a myriad of, of different uh, endeavors, but there's four major programs that we run, and that is child protective investigations, adult protective services, economic self-sufficiency, which is your food stamps and cash assistance programs, uh, and substance abuse and mental health. Quite a big, uh, quite a lot of things you cover there. It, it, it's a huge quite region, a six counties. I think we have close to 1,200 employees uh, in the southeast region, uh, and it is, it keeps us busy. It's got to. Um, on the child protective side, we'll, we'll start with that. We. We all hear these terrible stories about things happening with kids. So you get in there and you work with law enforcement on those issues when you get a case, uh, when you hear about some sort of an abuse situation? Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the scenario starts when somebody uh, notifies the abuse hotline and, and has some allegation of abuse and neglect in the community. Uh, the hotline sends the case down to the region. We assign it to what it, whichever circuit it belongs to, and then that circuit, the investigators uh, link up with local police department that kind of go out and do a joint investigation. All right, and Bob McPartland, you are working with the hands-on situations in our particular area uh, on a daily basis. Uh, how busy is it in this part of town, in this area where we are here in Port St. Lucie? Well, in our area, Circuit 19, which of course is St. Lucie, Indian River, Martin, and Okeechobee counties, we receive roughly 6,000 child abuse reports each and every year. And roughly half of those are St. Lucie County, so about 3,000 child abuse reports. We have roughly, we have eight investigative units across all four counties, which are roughly about 50 child protective investigators. And they get between 12 to 15 abuse reports each and every month. Okay, so uh, you're familiar with the organization CASEL, and every year CASEL does their field of flags in Port St. Lucie, which is all these flags that are set up in memory of each child who died through some sort of abuse the year before. Um, so it's a reminder to us, we've had them on this program, it's a reminder of how serious this problem is. Um, 3,000 alone in St. Lucie County, that's, that's a lot to have to deal with here. There's 3,000 child abuse reports, yes. And CASEL, the memory field, it's Typically about 120 children throughout the state of Florida have, have lost their lives due to abuse or neglect. And one of the things that the department is trying to get out there is preventable child deaths. That's one of our big programs, public service announcements, because the leading causes of death for children under the age of five in the state of Florida are unsafe sleeping and drowning. And unsafe sleeping, we're trying to get out there, the safest way for children to sleep is alone in their crib on their back. You know, that's sometimes it's contrary to a lot of things people want to co-sleep and then with drowning we're trying to do drowning prevention and more supervision of children because all the families that move down to florida they want to give provide a florida lifestyle you know a pool in the backyard lake outside you're near the river but not all drownings happen in people's pools some of them happen in the swales or retention ponds and it's just so important to always keep an eye on your child as well as you know to teach them to swim when they are able another leading cause of death is leaving children in hot cars we're coming up to the summer months here in florida thankfully we haven't had any in the last couple of years but about three or four years ago we had two children that were left in hot cars and it doesn't take long for a car to heat up and then a child to you know perish due to the heat in the car it's a terrible situation, and we've gotten some good public service announcements through your organization that you're putting out there trying to spread the word, and we're glad to be a part of that with you to make that happen. So it, so it's, the abuse isn't always intentional. Or do you call it abuse if it's an accident? It's not abuse, but you're still focusing on the well-being of the child. Well, we would do investigations in certain situations, like in a drowning or an unsafe sleeping. We're, we're looking at 
in the investigation, were there other factors involved? Was alcohol or substances involved in that? Was there untreated mental illness or inadequate supervision? Because, I mean, if the child got out of the house and got in the pool and nobody had saw them for 15 or 20 minutes and you're talking a young child, you know, basically anywhere from 18 months to two years old and somebody wasn't watching them, those are some supervision issues that we need to look at. So is that a big part of your mission then, education, public education, letting people know what they need to do? My role with the department, I'm the community development administrator, that's one of the things that I do is I consider it kind of being a goodwill ambassador for the department because the vast majority of the public has no idea what the department does or what we do. You hear about it in the paper and it's like the department did something wrong or something along those lines and that's never the case. An investigator doesn't want to have a negative outcome with any family to keep in mind that the investigators these are the people that you go to church with these are the people that your children play ball with and they're very committed and dedicated to the service that they do so of the three thousand or so uh, a year that you get here in this area um, do some of those turn out to be just it's a minor correction all you need to do is show somebody how to do something better and you end up with a good story to tell at the end of the day that something went well, that somebody learned what you needed them to know and they're better off? Does that happen? Absolutely. The vast majority of the cases are typically unfounded, you know, which half of those. There's only about 5% of the cases that we receive where children have to be removed from the home. And that means they were at imminent risk of harm, so they had to be removed from the home. And typically, we look to place with family members because children do better with people that they know. Now, of course, a family member would have to pass a background check with no significant criminal history because we don't want to take a child from a bad situation and put them into an even worse situation. And if we can't find a relative or a friend, then unfortunately children have to go into foster care. That's another thing we're trying to raise awareness for. We need more foster homes here in our area. 30% of our children that are in foster care are placed out of our circuit. We have over 30 children who are placed up in Jacksonville, and that impedes not only sibling visitation, but parental visitation, because children get removed from a parent, but our goal is always to reunify with that parent if that can safely happen. And a leading cause for a lot of our removals in our circuit are due to substance abuse and domestic violence. And do you try to keep the siblings together if that's possible as well? We do everything we can to try and keep siblings together because before I came into this role, I was a child protective investigator. And one of the saddest things I always had to do was, granted, removing children from their parents is, is horrible. And I have yet to meet a parent who didn't love their child. It's just, you know, they didn't have the capacity to safely parent their children or to care for them. And it was always very upsetting when you remove a sibling group that's been together through this abuse and neglect for several years. Now you have to separate them from each other because there's not a foster home that can take all of them together. So we're looking to increase the capacity for our foster homes. That way we can keep siblings together. And if they do have to be separated, they'd be in close proximity to each other. That way hopefully they could still attend the same school, be involved in the same after school programs or attend the same churches if they did. Very good. And to put it in perspective, Ed, uh, in, in this area, the Circuit 19, we've averaged 37 removals per month over the last two years. Uh, so that's why the, you know there's such a need to bring on more foster parents, you know, so that we can keep these kids in the circuit uh, in caring, loving homes. Keep them close to where they yeah. know where they're comfortable the most. Yeah, and we work very closely. Our our community-based care lead agency in this area is Devereaux, and uh, they came into the area a little over a year ago, I think it is, uh, and they've done a fantastic job. And they actually have a. Um, an initiative going that just kicked off where they're trying to get, they call it 25 by 25. They want to get 25 new foster families on board by December 25th. And so a lot of work is going into that to bring more, more foster families into this area. Do you find uh, on the bigger level that maybe the statewide, is there more of a demand for services at DCF during economic tough times when there was a, we were experiencing Absolutely, a no decline? Absolutely, no doubt. It, it, across the board, up? in every area. 
and do you find it still continuing to grow now? Uh, we've lessened? had some, you know, it's 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 leveled off to some degree, but still not significantly. I mean, we're we are a very busy organization in all of our programs. You are, and you're in the news a lot, constantly. Um, and but people just may not fully understand exactly what your role is. So yeah, uh, that's important to help yeah. them learn about that and find out what exactly you do and, and all the services you offer. Do you also get involved in uh, maybe like classes, uh, teach parenting classes? maybe send somebody for some training, maybe you're just not doing something right. Do you get involved in that process at all? Well, a lot of the cases we get involved with, we'll always make referrals or recommendations at the end of a case, even if there isn't something going on at the time, you know, is to hand them information on 211 or here the St. Lucie Children's Services Council. They support a lot of programs and recommend like services through CASEL, which are recommended, which does parent education, work with healthy families and healthy start. Those are with young babies. You know, it could be a first time mother, doesn't know what to do. You know, it helps them, you know, deal with a lot of the situations that they're going to come with. You know, if a, if a baby's colicky, how you can handle that, address that, teething, different ways of child development, so they're more educated and more able to care for their children. Uh, I know another situation that's come up is the shaken baby syndrome. People just get so frustrated. Uh, is there a way to kind of help them understand, you know, this is it's a reaction of some kind, uh, reach out to let people know. Well, one of the uh, the PSAs that we have out that's been uh, very active is we call it "Who's Watching Your Child," and we pro try to bring awareness uh, that in many cases, especially shaken baby cases, uh, it's a paramour. It's not a biological parent who has done that. It's a paramour of the mother or the father uh, who is frustrated, typically very young, has very little parenting skills, and they get very frustrated, and that frustration comes out with the shaken baby. So we've, we, that's one of the PSAs that we're really putting out there heavily. Oh, great. Uh, there's so much that your organization does, it's kind of hard to cover it all. It's, it all connects into social services and social issues and, and family issues and really to take all that on is quite a task. Um, if somebody wants to know more, maybe they're interested in becoming a foster family of some kind or just to know more about your agency, uh, how can they find out a little bit more about you? Well, they can go to the, the, the Department of Children and Families website, which is at www.myflforfloridafamilies.com, and there's a whole abundance of information there you know to look at how to become a foster parent as well as the we have the the public service announcements that are on there for drowning prevention for unsafe sleeping don't leave your children in a hot car as Dennis just mentioned who's watching your child they can contact me my cell phone number is 772-708-2900 for any kind of information anybody who wants to become a foster parent we're also in need of guardian ad litems in this area or if people just want to get involved and be a mentor for youth i can assist them in in those the directions to take very good let's hope they'll feel free to contact you if they need to and let's hope that the need for your services continue to decline and and you won't have to uh, deal with so many bad situations uh, because that field of flags of the 122 that you, you mentioned there, it's just far too many. And so uh, we hope you can get out there and keep doing the good work that you're doing and uh, getting educating people and uh, trying to keep kids and families safe. It's very important work that you're doing. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right, uh, Bob McParlin and Dennis Miles, both with the Florida Department of Children and Families. Appreciate your time coming in here and uh, good luck with the rest of your mission. Thank you. Thank you Good for having us. All right. And we'll be back in a quick minute, so stay with us.